Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Mile High Game Guys Board Gaming Podcast. I'm your host, Adrian. I'm Zach. And I'm Jeff. And this episode is, as always, sponsored by our wonderful sponsors, Gray Fox Games. Uh, thank you guys for sponsoring the Wednesday banter and bullshit episodes. We it sounds like we it. shouldn't be sponsored by Halls, though. <laughs> yeah, we... Uh, less Halls and more Alka-Seltzer. Okay. I, I should have bought stock in Alka-Seltzer like a week ago because their prices had to have gone up for the amount of Alka- Alka-Seltzer I've consumed in the last, you know, week. Uh, That's impressive. Clearly, I'm, I'm uh, not, not at my finest, dear we, listener. We were at a convention... But you did not catch this at the convention. No, this is you not brought con this crud. To the convention, yes. you were the cron cutter. <laughs> yes, uh, everybody who gets sick from Geekway, if it's a wicked cough and sore throat, uh, feel free to blame me. I will accept that blame. To be fair, it's possible it's one of our coworkers. Oh, that's definitely where it came from. <laughs> Fucking Tedder coming to work sick, and then inevitably one of the small children of his girlfriend. Oh God. Yeah. Yep. Tiny humans. We have patients zero. <laughs> sources of all plagues and illnesses on the planet I are am, tiny humans. I am currently not sick. Zach might be getting sick. Or it might also just be a sinus thing that I get once or twice it's a year. true. And then we have to be locked in a room for you over multiple hours yep. while recording a podcast. Well, I mean, if this room is small enough to force you to get sick, then the car that we took to and from Geekway <laughs> for, definitely was small enough. For about 24 plus hours <laughs> yeah. of being in a small vehicle. Yeah. Um, no, it's it's interesting. It's been coming and going. Like, there were definitely times uh, at the con where my voice was completely shot and I was not functioning. But then I'd be like, oh, I feel great today. I'm not really coughing that much. The sore throat's kind of gone. I feel good. I had some fried chicken. I had some fried chicken. Had some good barbecue. You know, but then there were then there were days like today where I can barely function. Like my entire body is just telling me to go crawl into bed and sleep. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, you guys had to ring the doorbell multiple times, <laughs> and then eventually just call me because yeah. the doorbell was not doing the trick. Yeah. Well, uh, when I was waiting, Jeff came up and he's like, "Did you call him?" I'm like, "No, I just like to passive aggressively push <laughs> buttons." <laughs> <laughs> Sounds right. Um, so yes, I apologize for my hoarseness. Dear listeners, you will be coughing. I will be. I will but be on coughing. This, but on this new mic setup, we can totally just mute that. Yes. With our our multi track recording that we exactly. now exactly yes. It, it you know it just means Zach's gonna have to actually pay attention when he edits <laughs> to catch all of the times I cough in and the not just of everyone and not just it. zone out around two a.m. when you start editing. <laughs> now listen, that was the the <laughs> tail end of that part. Uh-huh. So and Adrian said the wrong thing, so it's not my fault. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, apparently those of you who listened to last Wednesday's episode, which should be all of you, I would hope. Um, I mean, I'm, there's... Sh- I'm sure nobody, re- I mean, I-, I was surprised how many people noticed cause that meant they went, got all the way through the to episode. The end of the episode yeah. <laughs> uh, there is an official mile high game guys. First official correction to a previous episode. I said to contact us, you could email or you could find us online. And apparently I said, denvergamenight.com. You did indeed. And, Although you, there is a website at denvergamenight.com. For our weekly Denver board game brewery meetup group. Correct. Um, so if you're in Denver, feel free to go to denvergamenight.com and find out where we're going to be playing board games. But our website is milehighgameguys.com. Indeed. Because we are the Mile High Game Guys podcast, not the Denver Game Night podcast. No. Correct. So. Oh, even dear. Th- even though sometimes we are the Denver Game Night podcast. Sometimes. <laughs> we, are, we are most, most of our listeners are the Denver Game Night <laughs> I don't think that's true anymore. That no, was definitely true at the beginning. True. Yeah. Um, no, that, I mean, there was a honeymoon period in the beginning, like, oh, our friends are doing podcasts, and it's like, oh, I got to hear their shit at game night and on podcasts. Uh-huh. It's way too much stuff on a Wednesday to, li- to hear from us. Yeah. A <laughs> uh, few friends still listen, but. At 2X. At 2X. <laughs> at 2X. <laughs> so it sounds like somebody else is talking. Indeed. Yes, that's one way to handle it. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> So let's uh, let's talk about games and games we've been playing and things like that because that's what people are here for. But um, but not talk about anything at Geekway because that's literally our entire Friday episode because this episode would be four hours long if we talked about all the games we played at Geekway. Correct. Friday's episode <laughs> will be a Geekway recap. Um, so we played a lot of games at Geekway, but we're mostly going to talk about the games we played. Before Geekway. Indeed. I say mostly because I'm totally going to talk about Geekway games. Because yes. I didn't play anything before. No, you did no. not. 
You, uh, yeah, you were you were busy going to drive-in movie theaters. Yeah, for Megan's twenty eighth birthday. She's only twenty eight. She's only twenty eight. You're old. I am. <laughs> uh, so I know you're supposed to see Black Panther, uh, Infinity War, and then Super Troopers two. All part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how did how did that go? Uh, so apparently they changed their schedule uh, on fairly short notice. So on Tuesday, those were what they said were going to be showing. When we got there Thursday, they had changed it a little bit. It was now Rampage, the new Dwayne the Rock Johnson movie, uh-huh. and then it was Avengers, and then it was Super Troopers. Oh, uh-huh. they started forty five minutes late. So we watched Rampage, which is a movie. If you like seeing big CGI monsters wreck things. I've heard it wasn't that you, bad. Or if you like The Rock, I you'll also probably like, enjoy it. The Rock is also pretty great. The Rock is fantastic. He's a national treasure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't hate it. Like, I feel like a drive-in movie theater is an appropriate place to watch it. Like, it's, it's certainly no work of cinematic masterpiece. It's, you know, standard summer action flick. Um, Avengers was still good. On my second viewing, still really enjoyed it on the second viewing. And uh, be- then, be- though, because they'd started 45 minutes late, by the time Avengers wrapped up, it was already 1.30 in the morning. And we had previously agreed to meet at approximately 2 o'clock in uh, the morning. 2.30. Two two, yeah, around 2.30 two. to 3. Yes. Uh, to to leave for Geekway. And so we did. we felt that if we stayed for Super Troopers 2 then I would not get back in time. Especially um, because we had agreed to stay up. Jeff and I were going to stay up that late. Because we could, were at game night. Yeah, because if it was going to be a couple hours later, it's like, oh, we could, we probably could have gotten some sleep. But like, Adrian's like, oh, no, get here early. You guys can sleep in the car, and then I'll drive. Yes. I, did, I did sleep for like two hours. You did. I, and I had two one-hour periods, apparently. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah so, so we bailed on Super Troopers 2. Plus, Megan was getting quite tired herself. She was mm-hmm. like, I, I would kind of like to just go home and go to sleep. And so that's what we did. We came, we got home about one forty-five. I spent some time packing, um, getting ready. And then Zach arrived. We loaded the car and then we sat outside and chit chatted while we waited for Jeff to arrive. I was on the two thirty to three window. Yes. Zach was clearly on the two to two thirty window. Correct. I got there at two thirty. Oh, okay. And then uh, you arrived. We loaded up your couple like things two in the car. Thing. Yeah, yeah like I did some, not have much. Some, <laughs> some that was beer. also why, because most of the shit was here. Yeah. Yes. Loaded it up and then got on the road. We we were on the highway by 3 a.m. Mm-hmm. Uh, and heading east to the great state of misery. I mean, I'm sorry, Missouri. Wagons east. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so that was what I did Wednesday night instead of instead of playing games. Um, what about you guys? What did you end up playing at game night? I don't know the best place to put this into the podcast. Okay. Oh, on, okay. On the way back from Geekway. We can just put all the travel in here. Yeah. Okay, sure. Um, we listened to a fantastic podcast. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, it was a great one. Um, I thought it would be entertaining to download a podcast called All Systems Goku. Great name. Great fantastic name. Fantastic name. Yeah, good um, name. It's from it's from the wide world of the giant bomb uh that I love. And it is two of them that are listening or are watching um Dragon Ball Z Kai uh and Dragon Ball Z dragon ball period for the very first time and then they will watch five episode chunks and then talk about it on a podcast coming in from like not knowing anime not knowing dragon ball and it's hilarious it was surprisingly funny yeah Yeah. (laughs) Uh, a lot of wrestling references Mm -hmm. uh that i don't quite catch as a semi casual wrestling fan um but very entertaining Especially because I had an eight-hour chunk of driving. Yeah, and they, uh, they, they really hated Yamcha. And I was like, man, I, I can get behind that. Man, they <laughs> really just shred into Yamcha at, at every opportunity. There as was... much as we talk about shit at the beginning of our episode, basically take a... It's only an hour-long podcast. We're not an hour-long podcast. Uh, they take at least a chunk of every episode and talk about either Krillin blowing up <laughs> <laughs> in the most hilarious way... Uh, or Yamcha being such a piece of garbage. Yamcha's the worst, apparently. I don't know. I don't watch Dragon Ball. I don't watch anime. Have you ever watched Dragon Ball? No. Okay. I'm vaguely familiar with Dragon Ball as a thing. Like, I've seen clips and you, you know, you're, I'm you've probably played internet. a video game with the, the, the Dragon Ball in it. I have. I, I'm sure you have at some point. 
ever? Never? You had, didn't have a friend that had a Dragon Ball video game? No. You answered your question right there. <sighs> Friends, yeah. yeah. I, that's where I should have <laughs> ended the question. <laughs> I hate you guys. <laughs> uh, but it all started from the Dragon Ball uh, Fighters video game yeah. that came out. They were like, oh, let's watch the show. And then like out of that, they've kind of gleamed like, oh, this is these characters and stuff like that. Um, that was yeah. that was a very entertaining podcast period of like four ish or more hours. It, it was it was interesting to me, like not knowing Dragon Ball at all, listening to them talk about it, and like what I do know about it from you know like, again just gleaning Os- this osmosis, osmosis, yeah. yes. Uh, you know, I hang out in nerd culture a fair amount, and so there's a lot of people who enjoy Dragon Ball in my general sphere. Um, like one of their early episodes, they were like, you know, they had this there was a big battle with Goku and. They're like, Frieza, oh, Frieza. Mm-hmm. They're like, oh yeah, I don't, I don't think Frieza's really gonna be around anymore. You know, like they'll do other things or something. And Zach just snorts, because like... <laughs> of course he comes back. <laughs> yep, you idiots. <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah, I, I also got a, a a huge, huge amount of enjoyment out of their uh, hating of Yamcha. And he just that was that was the main thing that I kept hearing when I was in the back seat was just. Like they were at one point like, I feel like this episode is just going to be us just talking shit on Yamcha. He showed back up, and he's got just a stupid fucking haircut. Like, <laughs> fuck Yamcha. <laughs> got like an electrical cord belt. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yamcha is just a normal human dude, but so is Krillin, and Yamcha sucks. <laughs> uh, and Krillin's pretty okay. Yeah, pretty. he's pretty cool. Yeah. He was like a, one of the main bad guys slash like then turned friends from the first Dragon Ball. Yeah. So they just kind of keep him around. Except where they immediately killed him. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Indeed. Um, yeah, so that was that was the drive back. Um other aside from Dragon Ball podcasts, we listened to a lot of comedy shows when Zach was driving. Yes. Paul F. Tompkins. Oh yeah. Very a lot funny. of Paul F. Tompkins. It was the most Paul F. Tompkins I've I've heard. I have seen Paul F. Tompkins mm-hmm. before on the the uh weekly eight like I love the eighties. And mm-hmm. etc. shows of the VHS or VH uh, VH1, right, right, um, yeah. And uh, but this was the most stand up I've seen him do before. Yeah, his his stand up was great. Yes, it was all hilarious. It was quite funny, indeed. And and I just always pictured him. Does he always have a mustache? He grew it in like the early two thousands or something and like it's that. Never stopped. No, and then um, around that time too, he started just going all suit. Yeah, too. Yes. So yeah, he's not just there with like a t shirt and jeans. No, not anymore. No. Yeah, it's good times. Good times. Long, mm. long car rides, but good times. Indeed. Anyway, back to what we've gaming, gaming things, gaming things. So, Zach, what did you play at game night um, last week, which uh, was at Zuni Street? Really? Zuni Street, yeah. Uh, so, I played uh, one of the games I played is uh, Pioneer Days, which is uh, a game that we just got recently. Yes, we uh, we got a review copy of Pioneer Days from Tasty Minstrel Games. Yes. And I'm going to let Jeff talk about that one because okay. there's another game I wanted to talk about. And that was one that I played last or the, the, week pre, before. the week before okay. that, that we're... Paul gave me shit for, for not talking about. Oh yes. <laughs> we're going, we're going deep back in time. Yeah. The way back machine to, to the pirate days to <laughs> nine days ago, <laughs> deep, deep nine days. Yeah. Uh, so it was for pirate billiards, a bullshit decks game. If I'm not mistaken, yeah, that is 100% Paul. That's <laughs> extremely, Light dexterity games and just the heaviest crushing weight of heavy games. Yep, and That's... and then all cooperative games, and then co-op. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this one basically it, it can play at the four players, and you have this. Uh, basically, imagine like a, a chessboard, but the holes instead of where the the squares are. Like so, it's a, a grid of a, wood planks. Yeah, exactly. And then you have a, a canvas underneath it. It's basically been stabled on all sides, and so you have this lo- basically a long pipe looking thing. That you're using to hit balls that are in the the little you know the squares. You're trying to hit balls from one side to the other, and if your ball, if you're, <laughs> so, so tell me about your balls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. When you uh, if you hit one of these balls into another player's like a a square that has another player's. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Just get used to saying the word I know, balls I know. a lot. <laughs> so uh, many and we balls. should we should say that we will have a picture of this on in the notes in case you're confused right now of what Zach's talking about. Yeah. Because it is not the easiest thing to describe. No. Yeah, and you, you call that a pipe. I would say it's like a weird custom croquet mallet. I mean, yes, but I just called it a, it looked like a corn cob pipe sort of thing. With like a, <laughs> a very long a foot and a half long stick yes. on the end of it. Yeah. 
Think of uh, was it Gandalf's pipe? <laughs> okay. Yes. Because you said pipe, I immediately thought I know. like, I got much like a, metal, a metal tube. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now that makes sense then. Uh, but yeah, you're basically um, when you're four players, you have you have your balls lined up in se- the seven spaces in front of you, and you're trying to hit your balls into the other players like squares, basically those seven squares, uh, and you get points based off of that. But if you if you ever hit one of your balls into an opponent's like a square that has an opponent's ball in it, you get to capture theirs, and then that's worth points too. And uh, basically, you keep going until you don't have any more pieces. Somebody doesn't have any more pieces to hit uh, because if you ever knock a piece off the board, then it's uh, then it's out of the game, and everybody just keeps turn taking hitting one of those balls out of a square until that happens. Basically, okay. It was it's a hundred percent a bullshit dexterity game. It was we had a lot of fun just because those. Those things never go anywhere where you want them to. Of course not. I had a lot of bullshit hits, which were great. <laughs> where I ha- like I hit one and then it like went onto the edge of the board, rolled like six down and then fell back into it. <laughs> 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 we're like, what the <laughs> fuck just happened? <laughs> or you're trying to hit it. You're trying to be like, oh, I just want to go one forward and you end up just hitting it one back. And you're like, God damn it, not again. <laughs> <'Cause> it, <laughs> because it's very hard. Like, you think you have a good idea of where you want to hit it because you're just hitting the canvas, and you're like, do I hit, like, behind the canvas or, you know, the canvas behind the ball? Is it going to make it bounce forward or is it going to make it bounce back? Is it going to bounce off that wood piece and then bounce back or bounce to the sides because I was aiming it sort of sideways? Um, So it's definitely something you can get good at, but... What's the extra ball? Like, the picture Jeff has shows four, like, all four of the different colors, yellow, blue, green, black, and then... or. Yellow, blue, green, red, and then there's a single black ball in the center. I have no idea we didn't play with that. Slash, I don't know if Paul's <laughs> copy came with that. Okay. So. It's quite the thing. Yeah. Because you're hitting it from underneath. Mm-hmm. And what was great is that Ant was great at it in between the games when he was just practicing. Just fucking around? Yeah. <laughs> but any time he was actually playing the game, no. Where where were you guys when you played this? Uh, this is, we were at Paul's place. Okay. Uh, you definitely need a level playing field for it because. Oh. Yeah. This game, weird. Yeah, it's, I know. You can't just, yeah. <laughs> I want to play it on a hillside, Zach. You're saying that's not a good idea? No, you can't do it. I mean, you can dig holes into the hillside until it bounces out, then you're fine. Well, then whoever's on the uphill side is going to be real fucked. Yeah, don't be that guy then. Okay. <laughs> Call dibs. Dibs. I mean, dibs only works when you're in the actual location. Weren't you watching something about true, you were watching the true level clip from Rick and Morty this weekend? At some <laughs> yes. Point? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like, that part. That that's part. a great clip. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why you were listening to that, but I was just like, all right. I don't remember either, but it's just one of the things. I want to watch this again. <laughs> Speaking of watching things and totally mm-hmm. off topic again, uh, Shin Godzilla. Holy shit. That was that Godzilla clip mm-hmm. we watched last night? Yeah. Oh, my God. Did you watch the movie or just that clip? I just I watched some more stuff oh, from okay. it, but like, holy shit. Yeah, Godzilla Rex Tokyo, real good. In a very impressive way. Yeah. Just casually whips his head around and it's like, oh, there goes half the city. <laughs> He's got like a crazy laser beam yep. that just like you're used to like the the breath, like a flamethrower, mm-hmm. but this one's just like a sharp point of death. It, it's like a lightsaber came out of his mouth <laughs> that just stretched to the horizon and he just whacked it through the city. <laughs> <laughs> I recommend everyone go see that clip immediately. Yeah. I've heard really good things about the movie. Yeah. So. I'm sad I didn't see it in theaters. Yeah. I love Godzilla. Right on. Uh well. Jeff, what about you? What did you play game night? Got some pioneer days, according to Zach. Indeed, the wide days of pioneers was played. Uh, it was uh, pretty easy set up. Uh, components are great, super thick. Uh, com- uh, cardboard chits for pretty much everything. Uh, player boards are like, I don't know, like linen player boards. I don't know what you would call them. They seemed very, very nice though. So you choose a character and you have the option of using their like unique player power or flipping it over for just a general one. Uh, and you get a wagon and you get a, you set up a, a, a town with equipment and uh, various storm or like disaster tracks being like raided or uh, like a, a thunderstorm or disease or famine. And you have a certain amount of different colored dice. Uh, I think there's what five different there's five different colors. Yes. And then you'll have three uh you'll have plus one sets for each player's plus one and mm-hmm. how many sets you have. So we played two players so we had three of each three color. Three sets. Um and you go through a week of uh rolling dice uh which is you roll amount of players plus one. <laughs> you roll one fifth of the dice you would say. <laughs> Indeed. Um 
And then uh, there's six different facings that will be different actions you can take on the board, and those actions can turn into either money, doing that action, or recruiting the person that's uh, in that slot, the townsfolk, uh, which all have uh, special powers to make things cheaper or, I don't know, basically everything in the game. Uh, the nice part is uh, the sets you can use for those townsfolk, there's like five different sets, a lot like Agricola. Uh, you just combine two of them. There's like A, B, C, D, E, and you can use like C and E or A and B or whatever. So you can kind of swap it up kind of however you want. Uh, a lot of variable setup, which is appreciated. Um, so you'll go through picking dice, and then whatever dice you don't use, you put it on the track, and whatever color that one is matches a disaster track, which will move it up. There is also, uh, it's like uh, blue, red, yellow, green, and then there's black. Uh, if no one chooses the black die, it moves all of them up. So oh, That sucks. It's so, not a, you don't want to leave that one alone. Uh, it is not a cooperative game. Um, and some of the decks do add some interaction in there. There wasn't really much interaction in this one. It was definitely a denial game. Like, I'm going to recruit this person before you can get it, or I can get this equipment before you can, uh, or I'm going to move this disaster. I'm going to choose this die so the disaster track moves up because I know you don't have anything to do about that disaster, and you're going to get fucked because that one's going to go up, and I'm fine. Yeah. Like, it's it's cattle, and Jeff has four cattle, and I don't have any cattle. It's like, I don't care if that one goes up then. Yeah, because uh, famine, it's like you have to pay money for each cattle you have. Um, then it'll have like a victory point tracker on there for each, um, town phase at the end of the week. You have some needs, uh, favors to do for the city, which is like giving them cattle or money or gold. Uh, cause you can do like gold panning and, uh, that's how you get like a, a majority chunk of the victory points for the game. Yeah. Uh, cause each favor is worth two victory points and some of the favors give you like two, three, four, uh, of favors, which is, you know two, four, six, eight victory points. Okay. Another way is uh, getting cattle at the end of the, the week, too, oh, which is nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah, just having cattle, period. For every cattle you get, you have two like what's it, two victory points? One, one. One victory point for every cattle. And then uh, certain, uh, or all of the townsfolk, uh, they have a victory condition. It's like one for every wood and medicine, or one for cattle, or yep. one for your wagons and stuff like that. Yeah, because you can buy more cattle, uh, buy, buy more wagons, because your wagons are where you store your inventory. Uh, and some of the disasters can, like, damage them and, like, you'll lose inventory spots. And uh, you go for four weeks, I think, four or five weeks. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, four or five rounds. Uh, and then all the disasters move up one more time. And then you do end game scoring. Right on. Yeah. It was a pretty basic game, but mm -hmm. entertaining. Yeah. Played, I'd, played I'd, pretty quick. Yeah. It took, like, the 45 or 50 minutes. Yeah. Uh, even with, you know, a first game. Cool. And uh, Learning. I'm, yeah, and uh, I would be, I would be more curious. I would definitely be curious to see how it plays with more people, more people, and some of the more complicated decks, yeah. uh, townsfolk decks, because that I think is where a lot of the variability is going to come in there. Because mm -hmm. uh, some of them are really nice. Like I I recruited a townsfolk that was a beaver, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it gave I gave I got a wood as uh, a wood as soon as I recruited it, uh, and then I got a free wood at the beginning of every week um, because. You can kind of like buy wood and stuff through mm -hmm. there, but it's you want to do so much, but you don't have that much time to do it. Yeah, especially uh, because you see those favors at the beginning of the week, so you know what you need to go for. But mm -hmm. you also see how close each of the disasters are, and you know all of those dice are coming up, and so at least five things are moving moving up, and so you have to try and plan for that. Yeah, uh, I do also have to say everything fits really nice. Uh, all the like uh the town cards. Oh, like art wise. Yeah, uh, yeah, art wise. Like when the town card goes onto the the board where it's supposed to go, it fits in with the art behind it mm -hmm. like perfectly. Yeah. Uh, which is you know a small thing, but appreciated. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, the first player marker in a two player game. Uh, don't even bother because <laughs> the first player marker is supposed to move between each roll, and there's like five rolls a week, and so you're just passing it back and forth all the time. Uh, with two players, we just handed. Like, I would grab the bag first, take the dice out, and then hand you the bag, and then roll it. And then it basically, it's like, first player is whoever just has the bag. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, and it comes with a, a dice bag, and then it comes with, like, a gold, like, mining bag that you mm -hmm. can, like, dig gold nuggets and stuff out of. And uh, all great components. Yeah. And it even had, like, equipment that, uh, when you get equipment, it lets you... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, say it's, like, it has it has one for basically each one of the different phases. And it's like, oh, when you go... 
uh, you know, you get medicine, you're also going to get money or cattle or gold or any of those things. And okay. E- and like even the the townsfolk, whenever you pick a die that has that symbol on it, mm-hmm. you'll get some sort of bonus. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you're you're worrying about a bunch of different things, but it it all comes out uh pretty easy to do, like not complicated to explain to anyone. Pretty yeah. pretty simple. And you can definitely focus on things on this one, but if you aren't prepared for that it can it can bite you because i had one that was based on a lot of points based on these um these town folk and i didn't have enough medicine and so three of them got wiped out and i was like well god damn it yeah disease <laughs> that's unfortunate disease yeah. ruined. i i ended up getting some really nice townsfolk that were like just ignore disease on two townsfolk and or ignore t- a famine on two cattle and just was like that's a whole chunk of things that i don't even have to worry mm-hmm. about anymore yeah and cool. uh the the characters that you play as they have a regular side and a you know an actual specific side yes which i mentioned at the yeah beginning. yeah but i was gonna say just always play with that like yeah they're they're not too complicated to where you need to have the like simple version okay but they yeah. do have start different starting equipment and stuff mm-hmm. but it's yeah. minor in variation well like in mine was like you can use wood as medicine or medicine as what like you can you can change them in you know whenever yeah. you want and so those are like the two basic resources mm-hmm. yeah but also okay. like the most expensive resources for some reason, if yeah. you want it, because you can always just be like, I'm going to trade this medicine die in for money. And medicine was six and wood was five. And huh. yeah, but they're also the easiest to store. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. It's a good game. I liked it. Cool. Well, yeah. we'll, uh, we'll play it some more and we'll get a review out there for, for everyone to really hear our deep, mm-hmm. deep thoughts on it. Deep, deep, sick thoughts on it. Indeed. Like your voice. Yes. <laughs> Uh, no bloody minute. I understand this week, Jeff. No, no bloody minute. Uh, Ant had a, uh, tournament, uh, at, uh, the Colorado Springs, Mm -hmm. uh, this weekend that he placed first at. Yes. Uh, Ant's winning tournaments all over the place. Yes. Um, but he is now, uh, second in the nation for Norse, uh, and 25th in the world for Norse. Damn. Yeah. Uh, and with how many, he had a bunch of points from the tournament and with how many, he was saying like with how many points he's getting from these tournaments, it's actually not too far off from him uh, getting first in the nation for the Norse race in Blood Bowl. That'd be pretty sweet. Yeah. Number one, a number one Blood Bowl player. Cray Cray. Cray Cray. Super Cray. Right on. Well. Uh... Also, also, my next match is against him. <laughs> have fun with he's, that. He's not playing Norse though. Yes. So <laughs> just his number two team, Undead. <laughs> Right on. Well, I think that uh, lets us move right over to news and Kickstarter then. Indeed it does. On to the wide world of news. First up in news, they are going to finally be reprinting Agricola All Creatures Big and Small, but not just the base game. They're doing a big box with all the expansions. Which is awesome. Adrian was very excited when I was like, hey, Adrian, look. Yeah, I've wanted this game for a while. I've heard it's a really good uh, example of the two-player versions of Uve games. Well, because I know originally you were like, oh, it's just Agricola, but without parts of Agricola. I'm not interested. Yeah, and then I've, I've since played uh, like the Laharve and the Cave versus Cave. So the Laharve one the in the port and Cave versus Cave. And they change enough uh, and distill enough that like it feels similar. But it's a different game, and I really uh, appreciate that. And since Megan and I play so many games together, having these little two-player games that we can knock out is uh, pretty fantastic. And All Creatures Big and Small has been uh, vastly out of print and hard to find for a long time. So uh, I do also want to point out that it's a big box edition, but it's not going to be a very big box. Uh, They're saying it's going to be somewhere around the size of, like, Baron Park, Isle of Sky, or Costa Rica. So eight and an average size box. Yeah, it, but a little other, smaller than average. The, the two player ones have always been really small, though. Yeah, it won't be one of those small little square boxes. But it also comes with all the expansions. Which I don't think all creatures being small ever was that square I, one. I, I don't even remember. remember. The, I don't remember the last time I even saw the box. I think it was. It was. was yeah. it? it might have been. I don't know. Somebody will correct us. I'm sure. I certainly hope so. Someone yeah. needs to. Uh, but it's supposed to be available at the UK Games Expo, which is in like two weeks, June 1st and 3rd. A uh, week at this point? A week. Yeah. Um, no price yet. Yep. No price and no date for US release. 
uh, that I have found. I'm sure so. it is inevitable. Yes. A UK UK only release. <laughs> that would be unfortunate. That would be very unfortunate. I just I actually. Oh, Katie's not going to the UK Games Expo. It's like I'll go. I'll tell Katie to pick it up at the UK Games Expo and then bring it to Origins because I'm going to Origins. Hooray! Quick little side news. I, I am officially going to Origins. So it's, it's news. That so, is news. Yeah. Um, and I almost completely forgot all about it. Yes, I got. I'm going to be working uh, a booth there for Deepwater Games. Um, and when is Origins? Origins is June 13th through the 18th. Are you going to be not sick by then? Yes, I should. Be. <laughs> well, my life is going to be real hectic. I'm going heavy con this weekend, mm-hmm. long camping weekend with Megan the next weekend, and then Origins. So I might not. My body might be just about to shut down entirely by the time that rolls around. Yeah, we'll see. I have to move. But, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. So I so I wish that I could tell Katie to get it from UK Games Expo and just bring it to Origins and give it to me there, but she's not going to the UK Games Expo. Maybe I can find somebody else there who will uh, mule it over for me. <laughs> to Origins. To Origins. Yes. So, anyway, on to the next bit of news. Uh, the next bit of news is uh, Betrayal at the House of the Hill um, is finally going to get some deluxe character tracker cards and dice from WizKids. Yeah, and it's bullshit. Wow. <laughs> People have been asking for this forever. Well, at first it looks better because orig- instead of doing the clips that it had before that kept falling off, this one now has a dial system. Little d- dial wheelie things. And you're like, oh, sweet, that, that, makes, it, that likes a, makes a lot more sense. But, but then uh, the, the art is not consistent with betrayal. At all. It's like cartoony, like The Sims art. Or like, no, no more like Civ 5 art. Yeah. Like it's that like kind of silly or Civ 6 art. Like that, that cartoony a little bit slightly, I don't know. It it does not fit. I just don't think it's that good. It's also not good. Uh, It super doesn't fit and it's also not good. So Um, subjectively, bad art. Subjectively, bad art. Objectively, the little wheels uh, that you move up and down, there's no more like, like top of track, bottom of track way to know like how close you are to being super dead. Yeah, or even like if I boost my might right now, do I get do I go to four or is it another three? Like if I'm at three might, depending on what character you are, you might have yeah. two or three tiers of three. There's no way to know on those. Plus, like I don't understand how they're fitting an entire freaking die inside a double sided player board dial inside a double double sided player board without making it ridiculously thick and awkward. Um, yeah, it was one of those Zach showed me it while we were at, at Geekway, and my initial response was like, oh, sweet. Finally. Then, but then I was like, oh, I don't like that art. And I was like, wait, that dial might not work so well. And then I was talking to Jeff earlier today, and he's like, oh, yeah, people have been complaining because you wouldn't be able to see the full track. And I was like, I didn't even think of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fuck that. <laughs> yeah. So it's really cool. I'm glad they're, like, doing an, something to address the bullshit clip issue in the uh, second edition of Betrayal. But this is not a good answer for it. Um, try again, WizKids. Unless try again. They, they might just print the numbers next to it, maybe, to help. You can, always just, you can always just move the dials up and down to kind of see what's your up and downs on there. I mean, that's going to be how you have to do yeah. it. Yeah, uh, It does also come with the green die that are replacing the, uh, the normal zero to two. Yeah, the dies. die look cool. Yeah. Depending on the price, it might be worth it just for the, the die. Um, but yeah. Not super excited. We'll see what the price is. Yeah. Because uh, if it's too much, then it's like, holy shit, what are you people thinking? No. But that will be available in September with those uh, Betrayal Upgrade kits. So if you're interested in them, you can go for it. I am not. Indeed. Uh, next up in news is Ticket to Ride New York. But this is not a normal Ticket to Ride. It's not just another, here's Ticket to Ride, colon, whatever. No, this is like... As if Ticket to Ride wasn't enough of a lightweight intro game, this is intro to Ticket to Ride. Yeah. It's going to be released exclusive to Target, like so many games are. I don't know how Target found out that like getting exclusive deals with modern board games is a good thing, but they did. Uh, and so it's going to be set in kind of an older era New York, uh, and you're going to be running cabs uh, linking destinations like the Bronx and Midtown 
and things like that. It's a much smaller map with shorter routes. Uh, looks like the longest route I see is three on this board. Um, four. There's a four pink. There is a four pink down there. So there's one four route. There's a few threes and then some twos and ones. Uh, they claim that it plays in about 15 minutes. So much smaller board, smaller footprint, a uh, quicker way to play as uh, play ticket to ride. I think it's interesting they went with taxis when there's subways in New York that are very much similar to trains and use tickets. Well, uh, the taxi is the wild. The rest is bus lines. What? Where do you see that? In the picture. That's a taxi. Those are buses. Well, because in the article it says using taxi cab pieces instead of the familiar Uh, railway cars. Yeah, it's weird. Uh, The the cards definitely show, uh, you know what, they're buses. They're definitely buses. Buses or train tracks or... Like Like streetcars? Yeah, streetcars. And then the wild is cab. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. At least. Yeah, that does make a little bit more sense. Theme. Consistent. (laughs) Perhaps. Uh, But yeah, and that's going to be releasing with an MSRP of about $20. Which is a reasonable price. Yeah, for a quick little short intro Ticket to Ride game. Uh, But we'll see if it's actually worth playing, just because, I don't know, 15 minutes seems like it might be too short. Definitely a filler game. Yeah. Yeah. But an interesting option to fill target Mm -hmm. shelves with. Yes. That I agree with. Instead of the, I think, MSRP on Ticket to Ride is like $49.99. Yeah, it, it... Well, it might be another really good way to get people who otherwise wouldn't try a game like that to try it. Like, oh, it's less expensive, you know, easier to learn, maybe. We will we'll, have to, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. Next up in news, uh, that Axis and Allies zombies thing we mentioned a little while ago finally has some uh, full-on ass details. And a release date. Yes. Uh, the release date is October 26th, just before Halloween. Um, and... It sounds like it's still basically going to be Axis and Allies in that the players are going to command one of those five Axis or Ally powers uh, fighting, you know, in World War II. But now there is a non-player faction of the undead that will be shambling out of the battlefield as casualties you inflict on your enemy are added to the zombie horde. Which I think that's a cool concept. Yeah. Um, Not really... Uh, much more information beyond that. It is going to, they, they have a components list that includes 215 plastic miniatures, including 30 zombies. So um, basically the, the old stuff plus the new stuff. It's also going to have paper money. Yeah, I saw that. I was just about <laughs> to say that. I was like, so that's a negative. Mm-hmm. Um, with a $40 MSRP though. That's so. a reasonable price for a copy of Axis and Allies. I, I feel like that's, yeah. If you love Axis and Allies, which a lot of people do, I give a ride to somebody who's t- telling me how their like kid had access and allies and they had all the versions of it. Oh geez. Like including that one. That's like a, t- a set of like the Eastern front and the Western or like the Eastern theater and the Western theater. Wow. You, you can combine both of them. Jeez. Yeah. So yeah, people still like that. I never really played it. Uh, I used me to neither. Pl- I used to play like Twilight Imperium and stuff with a group of friends, but they would always go and play access and allies when we weren't playing cool board games. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> so I never really played it. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, next up in news, we have, uh, from Games Workshop, they are announcing a second edition of Warhammer Age of Sigmar. Uh, Age of Sigmar famously came out three years ago to a giant wet fart. Uh, (laughs) what did you say? How did they describe it? You said to to the acclaim of some? The (laughs) the pleasure of some and disdain of others. Yes, in the article. Uh, it, also, they call it the fantasy skirmish game set in the Warhammer universe. I would call it the only fantasy skirmish game set in the Warhammer universe, or the only game set in the Warhammer universe, except uh, Vermintide, right? Which is the old universe. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're gonna have a new core rulebook, uh, expanded narrative and lore, which they've been doing with a lot of stuff and the various releases they've been doing. Uh, I was kind of going through what they've released since it came out. Um, still, nothing I want to play. Uh, if the chaos is still chaos ass chaos, the, the space Marine fantasy storm guard or whatever are still there. Uh, they've added steampunk dwarves. They now have Atlantean elves. Uh, it's elves with an A in front of the E. Yes. Um, the Dwarden as the dwarves. Uh, I, I, I faintly remembered years ago reading about how they wanted to do this so they could copyright fucking everything. They wanted a whole universe where they owned 
a hundred percent of it because you can't copyright elves or orcs or dwarves or anything like that. Um, so they made this, and it's it's disappointing to this day. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I well, just, that's mainly because you used to play Imperial Guard. But... I, I always play. I would. I never. I never really played a lot of Space Marines. Mm-hmm. I always played the Imperial Guard, which are the regular dudes trying to fight off all this crazy shit. And in uh, uh, Warhammer Fantasy, I played uh, Empire, which are just the regular dudes trying to fight off all this crazy shit. But there was no like Empire Space Marines, which Age of Sigmar has now. Mm-hmm. Um, or I played Bretonians, which I guess are the closest to space marine <laughs> humans as you can get because they all have a lot of armor because they're mm. knights. They're just all knights. Um, yeah, still, we'll still don't want to play Age of Sigmar. It might be cool, but I'm still just disappointed. Right. Oh, well, I remember when I first saw this, I was like, oh, I wonder if this will make Jeff. And I was like, Jeff, what is the, what is your problem with Sigmar? And you're like, basically the core concept. I'm like, <laughs> well, this is not going to change that. No. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's still Warhammer Fantasy, but it's not my Warhammer Fantasy. If I want to play my Warhammer Fantasy, I have to go play Vermintide 2. Yeah. Which is a great game. Mm-hmm. Indeed. So, you know, new additions for Games Workshop products. They happen all the time. Oh, but, yes. Know, here's another one. Got to keep that money train flowing. Just put that dump truck right to the back of the bank, and then they just dump out Space Marine miniatures. <laughs> Those things are like three fifty a pop. Terminators, $10 each. Not kidding. Oh, I know. I know. <laughs> That's it for news. Indeed. That wraps it all up. No more news. Possibly ever. <laughs> As is tradition, no more news ever until next week. Well, I mean, we just never know if there's going to be more news. There might not be. We don't want to be too I mean, definitive. I'll, history history would show that there will be more news, but we don't know that. I mean, I'm willing to bet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you're saying you're a betting man. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, after news comes the wide world of Kickstarters, and of which first is Crusader Kings, the board game, uh, which is well-funded, $200,000 on its $57,000 goal, about uh, 2,300 backers, about three weeks left to pledge this one, which you can for $68, or if you're smart, $91 for the deluxe edition. You know, you say that normally I tend to agree. I'm not sure the deluxe edition is actually worth it in this case. I would say 2,000 people might disagree with you. Well, I mean, people like minis. Yes, they do. Even minis that literally have no effect on the gameplay. Indeed. You do not play with them. They just sit there as a marker. Indeed. Uh, so, yeah, Crusader Kings is a board game coming out based off of the... Uh, Paradox, Sun- Paradox Interactive... Somewhat PC well-known video PC game. video game. Yeah. Crusader Kings. Um, you marry off children. Yeah. You assassinate people. It is extremely Dry and, tedious. and complex. <laughs> AKA, you, used, you used different words. A.K.A. dry and tedious. Not disagreeing. Um, and But aren't all heavy board games? No. Mm. No. no. You can use those words. I'll use my words. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is... A, an attempt to bring that down into a board game. Um, they stress that it's a strategy game at heart, but focuses with the character intrigue and all of the things that make the video game so good. Um, and yeah, there's not a ton of information on this Kickstarter, much to my chagrin of how it actually plays. Um, other than the fact that you're going to take on the role of a major medieval European dynasty, uh, which will depend on which scenario you're playing. There will be different scenarios where different dynasties are available. And you have your own little player board that represents your dynasty. And it's got uh, spaces for you to have a spouse, then to have children, to have different positive or negative traits, all of things. All these things are coming right out of the video game. Yeah, the heirs specifically. Yeah. And, and and traits are random, just like they are in the video game. You know, sometimes you, you make a really good marriage and you expect to have a really awesome son, and then he's, you know, a lustful, slothful braggart, which are all negative traits in the game, and everybody hates him. And you're like, well, I don't want that kid to take over my kingdom. I'm going to pay the nanny to smother him with a pillow. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know about the babies, very lustful. Yes. <laughs> One one of my favorite things, like they they do these traits and things right away in in the video game, um, 
si- slight sidebar here, major complaint I have with the game. Uh-huh. I was playing it not too long ago because it's dry and tedious, so of course I play it. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> um, and, I, and I had a child, and immediately my child's opinion of me was negative, and I was like, well, that's weird. Like, he's a baby. How does he already hate me? And I went and hovered over it, and one of the, the main ones was a minus 10 to his, his approval of me because he was my heir and I was still alive. <laughs> it's like, that seems like a great kid to have around. Yeah. Like, like, come on, baby. You don't even know you're, you're, you don't even know you're an heir yet. At least wait till you're a teen to start resenting me because I'm not dying and giving you the crown. Um, but anyway, as the game plays out, you're going to, uh, and just like in the video game, your, your player character, your starting character will die your heir will take over and then you start playing as them and then they can then potentially father more uh, children in the line and the line can continue on. Um, If at some point you do not have an heir and you die, the game ends. Uh, I don't think they've completely brought that over into the board game. Uh, The board game sounds like it'll actually have more real endings and I can't imagine they'll have player elimination because good God, I hope they don't have player elimination. (laughs) In a game like this. Especially a four-player. Like <laughs> big four-player strategy game. Because Crusader Kings is like 70-plus players. Like, every fucking minor thing you've ever heard of in history has their own fucking faction. Potentially. Oh, wow. Potentially, yes. I, I think the Aztecs and stuff are even in the game. And they can, like, if you play them well enough, they can tech up and start invading, like, Spain and Europe. <laughs> I think, yeah, in some of the expansions, they've, they've added that. Yeah. Um, the New World. The one I was playing recently, I took on some, I was some minor noble in a house in Spain when half of Spain, the Iberian Peninsula wasn't even Spain at the time. Half of the Iberian Peninsula was controlled by the Moorish Empire. Mm-hmm. And so like I had Cassus Belli, like an excuse to go to war basically for half of the, the, the Iberian Peninsula just because they worshiped a different god. Yeah. Like, those heathens. That sounds like... The medieval times. Yeah. yeah. Uh, super authentic game, uh, or tries to be. I don't know how much it actually, I, I don't know. Maybe Kaiser plays and he can give us a uh, <laughs> MHGG history lesson on how accurate uh, Crusader Kings really is in terms of things like this. Um, but I know like the, it takes forever to tech up in this game because they're like, tech didn't really advance much during this time frame. Heathen. And you can change laws and things, but that's all in the video game. The board game, not really sure how they're going to bring all of that. Like, I can't imagine bringing this down into a board game and having it really seem like the video game. It'd it, it, be like trying to do Civ, and you could end up with a new Dawn, which, yeah, I can see the roots there. I can see the influence, but they're vastly different and accomplish different things. I also don't understand why this game needs so many freaking minis. Yeah, that might be a little overkill for a game that might not need it, but, yeah. you know, I mean, he seemed a little big for the uh, the board yeah. the example here, too. Um, yeah. I don't super love the board. Looks it, it seems like most of the game is, like, the family board and the cards around it. The map seems to be a fairly small portion of, yeah. of the game. Mostly so, just for marking out what part of the Empire you control. Yeah. It's all about those menu mechanics behind the main map screen. Correct. Indeed. So, yeah, that's Crus- Crusader Kings, the board game. If you... Enjoy the video game. Maybe check it out and see if it sounds interesting to you. If you don't have any interest in the video game, you probably aren't going to have much interest in the board game, to be honest. that That's me. Yeah. <laughs> so feel free to hard pass. Yeah. Or don't. Yeah. Check it out. Crusader Kings, the board game on Kickstarter. Indeed. Speaking of hard pass, uh, <laughs> up next in Kickstarter is Nickelodeon's Splat Attack. Uh, well-funded $83.6,000. Uh, on a fifty thousand dollar goal, uh, about twelve hundred backers. About two weeks left to go. You can pledge for this nightmare for seventy dollars. Yes, <laughs> tons of minis though. Again, more and more minis. Everything's minis all the time now. Well, and the theme. Yes. Yeah. So the theme is. So this um, is from this is from IDW. So they do have a background of fulfilling Kickstarters yes, at the yes. very least. Mm-hmm. True. Uh, and so this. Now, I don't know, do either of you have a know, is Splat Attack like uh, an old Nickelodeon thing that existed? No, no it's okay. just getting all of these old cartoon characters together and th- throw food at each other. Yeah, so it's a food fight, a free-for-all food fight game featuring basically every Nickelodeon character from your childhood. 
They're going heavy on cashing in on love of miniatures and good God nostalgia. Yes. Uh, there's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. There's Rugrats. There's Hey Arnold. There's SpongeBob, Invader Zim, All Real Monsters. Like, if it's a Nickelodeon thing, it's Angry Rob, Beavers. Angry Beavers. Yes. Cat Dog. Uh, cat vs. Dog. No, it's, it's cat, dog. cat dog. dog. Okay. They're, they are the same cat yeah. dog. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's a cat and a dog who are the same being. Uh, the only one I, d- I don't know. Uh, uh, what go up? No, go back up. Oh, those are all real monsters that are just. Mm-hmm. I just didn't recognize oh. their. Oh names. no 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 no! Let's not forget the best of that entire generation of cartoons, Rocco's Modern Life. Yes. Oh God, yes, Rocco's Modern Life is even in it. Um, my favorite. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it is ultra dark and crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So essentially, in this game, like I said, it is a free for all. Um. Food, fight? food fighting game. And so everybody starts with a certain number of cool points. And then as you attack people, you can take those cool points. And if ever you take too many splats, you are out of the game and you keep playing until there's just one person left, I think. Um, but each character has a little player board uh, that is going to have their character with a polyomino shape on it. And then it has some stats like move, attack, uh, or aim, speed, and range. And so you can uh, you can move around the board with your speed. And then your range determines how far you can throw food. And you can use a throw action to, th- to throw food. And when you splat somebody, they get a different like little polyomino food shape that they didn't have to fit on their player board. And you have to cover one space for each hit result that the throwing character rolled. Um, and then you lose a cool point. And if your grid is ever completely full or if the tile you take won't fit on your grid, you're out. And the player who knocked you out gets a super cool point, not just a regular cool point. Uh, and you play until there's no more super cool points. And then that's when the game ends. So, And then each of the the people has their own like ability. Yeah, special like powers, things like that. There's There's cards that get drawn like different foods you can have different effects and you know depending on who who and how you hit them with it things like that seems so. like a pretty light game yeah uh seems light seems light hearted i do um, i do like how we take damage and you have like a little puzzle piece tetrisy kind of thing you have to make on your character sheet for your life yeah yeah um I'd be a little concerned that could slow the game down. You know, you splat somebody and then they spend 10 minutes trying to figure out how to perfectly <laughs> optimally build their little player board. It's definitely not this kind of game. No. You get two seconds max. Yeah. yeah <laughs> Throw it on the board. Two second sand timer. Mm-hmm. It should be. <laughs> it's just two two grains of sand that are falling. Yes. <laughs> uh, the minis look nice, but it doesn't look like any physical minis on here. They all look like CG models. Yep. I'm, I'm not a fan of the fact that they just, I get why they all have food. Because it's a food fight. Yeah. But like, especially the Ninja Turtles. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't want Michelangelo to be using sausages, even though it is in the second movie because they can't use weapons. That was a whole thing. Right. I was very disappointed as a child. I'm sure you were. Uh, he should have nunchucks. God damn it. <laughs> Did Leonardo <laughs> use the ice cream, the, the t- a Ninja Turtles ice cream bars? That and all then, looked weird and fucked up. Which I liked that that carried on to the picture. <laughs> With just eyes that aren't level enough <laughs> no. to be not weird. But yes, this is a game. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed it is. I mean, if you spent 15 bucks more, you can get the five to eight player expansion too. So Ooh. Ooh. for only $95. So the price point's a bit high mm-hmm. on this. Ant yeah. will probably try and find a way just to get the Ariel Monsters characters. I don't know. I mean, with if if they didn't have the food things, I would definitely agree with that. I don't know with the food. Yeah, we may never know. No, indeed not. I mean, I like the Reptar mini. That one it's, looks it's good, even Reptar. though he's covered in food. Is he covered in food? Yes. Okay. I mean, you can't really tell that on the mini itself. You can be like, it's just blood. He just killed a bunch of people. It's fine. <laughs> just sure. like Shin Godzilla. Exactly. Yeah. What you don't see is destroyed Tokyo behind him. <laughs> <laughs> like a like a lightsaber through a skyscraper. Yep. Yeah. Uh but yeah, that's uh splat, splat attack. attack. Indeed. Uh on to the next Kickstarter, which is Post Human Saga. Uh very well funded, 234,000 of its $30,000 goal, about 2700 backers, about 3 weeks left to go, and you can pledge this one 
for $59, or like everyone else at the $100 level. <laughs> that comes with everything. Yeah, so I know Katie from Katie's Game Corner has been talking a fair about fair amount about this lately. Um, it is a competitive survival adventure set in a post-apocalyptic world um, with two to four players. And this is what I think is interesting. They say it combines Euro mechanics with a finely crafted story. Um, so I'm interested in how that all actually plays out. Um, they list some key features as like really heavy story, uh, tight mechanics that work well with the theme to create an immersive experience, modular maps, variety of decks uh, to really add that variability, uh, unique heroes, so asymmetrical players, and a whole lot of world building and lore that evolve uh, through the various analog and digital games set in the post-human world. So this all kind of plays out together, it sounds like. Like they have a storybook that's included with it. Uh, that you can download there on the Kickstarter to check it out. Um, you know, Rado's review of it mentioned that it it's not like a depressing post-apocalypse. It's like a witty and interesting humor kind of post-apocalypse. He's lost to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess this is a same. They've done another Kickstarter just for post-human. Yeah. Uh, that was before this. Uh, but this is a totally different game from that uh, old okay. one. Right. I think that was uh, 2015. So this one's not a second edition. Not a. It's its own thing. Yeah. Same universe. Yeah. It's got a ton of components, a huge amount of stretch goals that uh, will be being worked through. Um, it definitely seems like one you'd want to go for the deluxe one if you could. Yeah. Uh, oh, mainly just for that fortress center piece alone. That thing looks really nice. Then also you get a bunch of uh, deluxe plastic components and, and stuff, so they look good. Yeah, they have a, a section down here. What changed from the first post-human? The short answer is everything. So... <laughs> Indeed. So yeah, that's supposed to human. Indeed. Uh, like I said, unfortunately, it's another one of those where they don't have a lot about how it actually plays, besides mentioning Euro mechanics and things like that. Uh, so I mean, that's not... everything you need to know. All the Euro games play the same, so you're like, okay, I get it. Yeah. Hmm. If only. Um, I don't know. A lot of cool bits. Not too many minis, but the minis that are there look really, really good. So. Yeah. See if you can find a game, gameplay video. See if it. There's a bunch of videos on the uh, yeah. Kickstarter that you can check out. So that's a post-human saga. Next up on Kickstarter is On Tour. Uh, Well-funded, 40000 of its $20,000 goal, about 1,200 backers and three weeks left to go, and you can pledge this one for $24. Indeed. Um, so the base game, the $24 game, plays one to four players and takes 20 minutes to play. Yeah, so this is a roll and write game. So for those of you amazingly not familiar with roll and write uh there is going to be a common pool of dice that are rolled that everybody's going to use to determine uh what numbers they write on their board that also has a deck of cards that's going to determine where on the board you can write uh looks like they have west central and east are the sections and so you'll roll the dice you'll flip a card and then everybody has to write those numbers in those regions on map uh, and you're going to do this until the maps are completely full at once, at which point you starting, uh, they, they say it just says that you start, uh, and draw a line through as many States as possible, starting low and working your way high. But the example they have doesn't have, Oh, never mind. I can see there's little dotted roads. So you have to connect them along the roadways. That's why that one isn't connected. Yes. Um, but you connect through the dots in ascending order trying to make the longest possible route through the u.s and whoever manages to do that is the winner <coughs> um there's wilds bonus points uh varial setup phase things like that that kind of uh add some variability to it they stress that for being a roll and write it's a uh deep it's like a deeper more strategic kind of roll and write um than normal and it can also apparently play as many people as you have boards for. Yeah. There's no <laughs> that's a lot restriction on it. You know, they even joke in here about getting thousands of people together to break a world record or something. Um, in fact, one of their pledge levels, the $48 level, is the base game plus eight additional maps and markers in the same box so that you can play 12 people uh, with this game. And even if you don't want to go that far, 
they're just three bucks for a map and a marker. Yeah. So no extra shipping, nothing because yeah. they just go right in the box. Uh, as it is. So yeah. Uh, I'm. I don't know. I might be interested in trying this one out, but it's definitely a one where it's just like everybody's sort of doing their own thing, and then who did the best at the end? Yes. So. Yeah, and they do talk about that. Like everybody gets the same inputs, and it's the outputs that make the difference. But you can't really affect anything anybody else does. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I mean the, the the component quality is great. Yeah, they went they went through the review. It's not like paper sheets that you're writing on, like a lot of roll and writes. Like they went and made big, nice folding dry erase boards. It was a dry erase markers, uh, two giant D tens. You know, bunch of stuff. Never played a roll and write. I played my first one this weekend. We'll talk about it on Friday's episode. <clears throat> I played a couple. It's about a fifteen by ten inch board. That's uh, or player the player boards when they're completely unfolded. That's a pretty decent sized player board. Yeah, it yeah. is. It's like a cool game. Yeah. So, yeah, go uh, check out On Tour if that sounds good to you. And that's it for Kickstarters. Indeed it is. Which, with news and Kickstarters in the bag, that brings us right on in to Jeff's favorite section of the show, emails. Emails at milehighgameguys.com if you would like to send us an email. Uh, first up in emails this week um, was one from uh, Jonathan. Uh, continuing the New York beef, clearly. <laughs> uh, which he has CC'd Craig on this one. Thank you. Uh, the, no, I should say the title is CC Craig. Indeed. Uh, hey, Mile HG guys. I just finished listening to Wednesday's episode, and while I'm sure I could just contact Craig directly on Slack... Using Jeff as a digital carrier pigeon to get the message there a week later is definitely the best way to do things, so please pass this along via podcast. Thank you. Uh, Hi, Craig. I wasn't trying to argue that I was the first listener from New York, but only that if Jeff had been doing his job, I would have been the first known listener via the podcast, as I mentioned the city in my contest email. I started listening shortly after Adrian appeared on the heavy cardboard playthrough of Food Chain Magnate, so I, so probably around May of last year. I would have been surprised if that gave me the claim of first New York listener, which is why I found Jeff's first known listener comment so strange. So basically, the point is, you're cool, but fuck Jeff. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, thank you for your service in keeping the wildlings north of the wall where they belong. While you're at it, though, could you try to do a better job of keeping out those cursed hell geese that shit all over every soccer field I've ever played on ever? Uh, They're Canada geese. There's no reason for them (laughs) to be in not Canada. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, P.S. I'm wrapping up my first year of teaching in about a month, so Jeff's assessment was 100% correct. I am a fucking disaster right now. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, it's a good I, one. We sort of just stopped doing all of those contest emails. Yeah, we'll have to do like a episode around them. Yeah, there were there were many, and they they're good. There's a lot of disasters. It's just hard to fit them in with all of the other bullshit we talk about. Yeah, I mean we could we could talk less bullshit, but I feel no, that's not going to. That's happen. not an no. option. No, it's clearly not the option. At least second emails. Uh, this one comes from Stephen, titled Candyland. Uh, hi guys. I hope you have been doing well. I just finished listening to your discussion episode about what makes a board game good or bad. I thought you guys had a great discussion. I applaud your effort to identify an objective standard for what makes a game good or bad. I think there are some objective characteristics that make any one game good or bad, but those are really hard to disentangle from each player's subjective judgments. Here's my thought. I think games are like movies. I've long believed that to determine whether a movie is good or bad, you must first try to identify identify what the director and writer were trying to accomplish with the film. If you can figure that out, you can then judge whether the goal was achieved. With this approach, a, a movie was meant purely to entertain can be judged a success if it, in fact, entertains the audience. Great example, Predator, besides just being... One of the greatest movies. Yeah, of all time. fantastic yeah. movie. Uh, the movie doesn't have to be high art to be good. On the other hand, a film that aims for that goal, uh, a film that aims for 
the status of high art can either succeed, Citizen Kane, or fail, the English patient. Uh, some would disagree with that assessment, but... And, and, the, and that he didn't include Predator on the, on, with That's Citizen true. Kane. And on high art there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> either succeed, Predator. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or fail, Predator 2. <laughs> Indeed. It's a fine movie. Gary <laughs> Busey's an actor. He's a national treasure, goddammit. it. That's where I uh, want to see fucking Predator in his L.A. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, <clears throat> uh, depending uh, on whether the goal was achieved, uh, and if you can't figure out what the director or writer were aiming for with a movie, then it's probably going to fail as a film no matter what. I think the same logic can apply to board games, which are, after all, a form of entertainment just like movies. So to determine whether a game is any good, I ask myself this question. What was the designer trying to achieve with the game? Was that goal achieved? If I can answer the first question at all, and then the second affirmatively, uh, it's probably a good game in my view. With that standard in mind, I think Adrian may have been a little unfair towards Candyland. Uh, is Candyland a bad game because the initial shuffle of the cards predetermines the outcome? <clears throat> I don't think so. The game is intended to be a pre-literate child's game first. The recommended age on Amazon is three to six years old. In all honesty, I think two and a half to five is probably a better range. Essentially the, essentially the preschool ages. Candyland requires no reading ability at all. A child only needs to recognize colors and some shapes and tell the difference between the numbers one and two. Uh, for a very young preschooler, however, these can be challenging tasks. Or Adrian to this day. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so a child who can look at a Candyland card and successfully figure out where to move on the board has really achieved something. It becomes an act of true player agency, even if the cards are still going to determine the ultimate outcome of the game. Uh, Candyland was self-consciously intended to pro uh, provide children with repeated opportunities to su successfully make such decisions. Uh, it achieves that goal while also giving the child an opportunity to beat his or her parents at a board game fair and square, which is a real bonus. Uh, so for this reason, I think Candyland is a good game. In my mind, complaining about the deterministic nature of Candyland is about as misguided as bemoaning the fact that Goodnight Moon doesn't have complex characters or an intricate plot. If you do that, you've missed the whole point. With that said, I do hope Adrian doesn't think I'm picking on him here. No, we're totally fine with it. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I think you guys did a great job on the episode. I just thought that more needed to be said about Candyland. Uh, I was hoping he would say, I think you guys did a great job doing that already. That's what I was hoping he'd say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, take care, Steve. Mm -hmm. I mean, he also missed one other thing that Candyland teaches kids at an early age, which is good to know. Sometimes the deck's stacked against you, and no matter what you can do, you're still going to fail. <laughs> true. True, true, true. Just, Just see really children. Make sure at two and a half years old, yeah. they start learning that lesson. Yeah, yeah. Just the world is out to crush you as hard as possible, and there's nothing you can do mm -hmm. about it. What can you do against the world? It's just made of fucking water and earth. It's gigantic. <laughs> it's huge. Godzilla can cut through it, though. <laughs> you're not Godzilla. I'm not Godzilla. Right on. Bring out your inner Godzilla. That's Indeed. what this is saying. That's, yes, absolutely. Oh, yes, that inner Godzilla. Mm -hmm. Yes, uplifting. <laughs> so that wraps up emails. Yes. Uh, we did, however, have responses to not one, but two of our old BGG threads. Emails Zach at milehighgameguys.com, you bastard. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to cycle <laughs> back around to it. No, I'm just going to cut you off. Anyway. Continue Zach, on. Zach, do you have those uh, BGG responses pulled up? I do. Uh, this is from Anthony. Uh, A.K.A. Tony. Yeah. He says, uh, Adrian and everybody else. That's what that <laughs> yes. all means, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Having spent time with you in Portugal, you seem to be a quick learner with new games. What is going through your mind when you're playing a game for the first time? Is there a standard approach that you always take? Or are you like Rain Man? Yeah. <laughs> Love from Tony. He is um, very similar to Rain Man. I can say that off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> except you throw toothpicks. He doesn't. Yeah, except he's. He just stares it. blankly. Yes. Without all of the. The genius part. <laughs> Such good friends. <laughs> and he's not related to Tom Cruise either, so it's like it's true. A, it's true. Paul, um, Paul Tompkins sat next to Tom Cruise. <laughs> 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 That's a callback. Yes, it is. Indeed. To something, to something they don't know about. Nope. <laughs> but if they know Paul Tompkins, yes, they know is. the story. Yeah. 
<laughs> Got to pick it, up on those line cues, buddy. Any <laughs> thanks, most famous man in the world. I don't need that coming from you. <laughs> um. Well, first of all, thanks, Tony. Um. That seems almost like a compliment. I'm a quick learner with new games. We had to crush him down before he realized yeah. it. Um. Going through my mind, I mean, it depends a lot on the game itself. Um, you know, for heavier games, I try to really pay attention to what is ultimately points and then how you get those points. So, like, you know, when somebody taught me food chain, they're like, oh, yeah, whoever has the most money at the end wins. It's like, all right, well, I need to figure out how to get money. Um, just like life. Just like <laughs> life. Uh, you know, whereas in other games, you know, like a race of the galaxy or something where you're, you're just playing cards that are worth a certain amount of points, it's, you know, more learning, trying to focus on like what I need to do to be able to play a lot of cards or, or whatever. Um, and then depending again on the game, you know, if it's a simple game mechanically, then I'm already trying to formulate some, some strategy, like what I want to do, uh, multiple turns in, like what things I want to go for, um, you know, if it's a more complicated game mechanically, then I'm I'm trying to suss out like how the mechanics are all going to interrelate and what they're going to do together, and then we start playing. and And I feel like half the time I get in, you know, I get in and just start pushing buttons and pulling levers and seeing what happens. Um, it might not seem that way, but sometimes I definitely feel like that's all I'm doing. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but yeah, like definitely the main thing that I try to take away from any rules teach when somebody's teaching me a new game is what is the end game like what what are points at the end like what's going to determine who wins and then how do i do that thing and then from there it depends greatly on the individual game how i how i go about it what about you guys like how do you what do you think about when you're learning a game for the first time how to play the game <laughs> insightful yeah. that, i yes. mean that, that always seems to be your bare minimum Jeff. Yes. you're just like i've learned the game i just gotta run over that bar yep. sometimes they knock the bar down <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, usually you've knocked the bar down and then you spend most of the game putting that bar back up to where it was. And then you you, you just walk over it because it's you easily could have just hobbled over it. Indeed. And then you, you walk and finally do it. And you're like, okay. And then everybody else is winning. Winning. And you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Hi, guys. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I mean, I would say just to. Right. Yeah. I have no standard approach. <laughs> right. Yeah. No. I mean, it's pretty much the same for me. I just learn the, the, the basics of the game and just sort of see how things work together. And then. Especially if everybody, like, I usually get it, like, halfway through. I'm like, okay, I see how these things sort of connect. And then there have definitely been times <laughs> where after a game I've had someone be like, oh, man, Zach, you did a great job doing this and this and this. And I'm like, yeah, I was trying to do this and this. You know, I was, oh, yeah, and I was trying to, I saw that you were doing this, so I was going to block this. But really in that moment I was like, oh, I'm just going to put this here and this here. And then I'm like, oh, look, I accidentally blocked Adrian for doing that. Sweet. Okay, that makes more sense. Cause <laughs> nice. <laughs> Son of a bitch. Yeah. I guess I just subconsciously just choose all the right moves. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> just subconsciously, the perfect player. Yeah. It's just the whole conscious part that gets in the way of it. <laughs> right. If I go into a stupor, fucking watch out. <laughs> That's explaining why you're so good at heavy games. Yes. Next question. Next question is from Wally. Uh, great question and piggybacking off of Tony's question. I've been diving into the deep end of the hobby lately, and I saw Adrian in a couple of the heavy cardboard playthroughs. The gallerist. The Estates, Halfway Through Food Chain Magnet. <laughs> what other uh, playthroughs, heavy cardboard or not, are you involved in? Do you do any additional prep work before joining the stream? Win or lose, your choices in game tend to be strategically sound. Are you, Rain Man? <laughs> we're, we're in no other streams? Uh, no, I have not been on any other streams that weren't heavy cardboard. Um, as for other heavy cardboard streams, I've been in roughly, a I want to say like a dozen, maybe two dozen somewhere in that realm that's a I mean I, range I, i've never watched any of them so i, I know to <laughs> uh, i'm just trying to think so i've done in addition to the three you've named i've done i was on the lignum i was on two different brass episodes the original brass and the roxley edition i was on um sidereal confluence i was on indonesia i was on uh, Sagas of Nog in the Nog just recently. I mean, that's nine right there. I know I've been on more than ten um, by a decent amount. I'm just drawing blanks on them. I uh, I should message Edward after HeavyCon and see if he has a if they keep good track of like who's been on what streams. Or maybe somebody who's a listener here and also a listener over at Heavy Cardboard and watches the streams might have better information about what streams I've actually been. You've on. You've been on them enough that people are like, "Hey, it's the guy with the hat." Yes. Yes, indeed. 
<sighs> so, um, prep work, not typically. It depends. <coughs> For live streams, no. Um, I if I haven't played a game and I'm going on a live stream, then part of it is for Edward to actually have somebody who he actually needs to teach the game to, which helps with the teach. Um, you know, because then there's somebody there who's asking the newbie questions, which I think helps those teaching live streams. Uh, if it's a game I've played before, then, you know, I already know how to play. I pay attention during the rules, teach just if I need any kind of a refresher and then just play. But I don't do any prep for, for live streams. Uh, I am doing some prep work. I'm going to be on an episode of uh, the Noya Hymet look back of theirs, uh, which is the estates is the new reprint of it. But I'm going to join him for a look back at their review of that. And I will be doing a lot of prep work for that, just like I do for our reviews. You know, I've played the game a few times. Uh, They have a definite format they stick to. So he sent me their outline. And so I'm going through that and already trying to think about like what I want to talk about, what I want to say for the for that episode. Um, As for the last part, I don't think I'm Rain Man. Uh, I could be wrong. But I, I do like to think that I'm a pretty good board gamer overall. I also just happen to play with a lot of other really good board gamers, which is the only reason I don't win all the time. But um, yeah, I'd like to think that's why my options tend to be strategically sound, is I'm a decent board gamer. And you have to play with people who are good. And I have to play with people who are good, which get good or lose. Or be deaf. I, I'll just continue to lose. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. But those ones, those couple that you win. Oh, but it's just so Makes tasty. them that much more satisfying. Mm. Oh. Gets me through the year. Yeah, <laughs> you're, you're you're a game winning camel. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> my my game win hump mm-hmm. is getting a little low. <laughs> I thought you won one game at Geekway. <laughs> Maybe two. <laughs> How many of them were co op? <laughs> anyway, we got one more question here from Wally. Uh, this one before you read it, Zach, just for context purposes, this is in direct response, I believe, unless I'm mistaken, to Jeff identifying himself as a game slut. When it came to the previous question about trying to nail down his taste in games. Yes. Gotcha. Or, or someone may have used that word to describe me. Probably, oh, that could be. Probably Zach. Anyway, anyway, Jeff is a game slut. That's what we're trying to say. Yes. Indeed. Right. Game slut. I like game slut. It's a good game. It's a good name. Yeah. Also, Hearthstone, perhaps out of the uh, out of the purview of the board of a board gaming show, but as another huge Hearthstone mark. When did you start playing the game, and what's your highest rank attained? Uh, I started playing the game <clears throat> immediately. Uh, when it came out, mm-hmm. I have played it since. I have had every monthly ranked card back since it came out in 2015. Uh, my highest rank is not that high, though. Maybe f- four or five. Um, What's high? Uh, one. And then after you get past rank one, you hit legendary. Okay. Which is like the, you get like global ranks and stuff. I've okay. never hit legendary. Mostly because it just takes a lot of time. My my win percentage is usually pretty high. I'm over 50%, but it just takes a lot of fucking games to get up there. And you only have a month to do it. They reset your rank every month. Well, uh, and especially with the ranks. When you win a game, you gain a star. But when you lose a game, you lose, you lose a, star. a star. So you have to win but another if, game to go if, back to where you were But before. if you win two games in a row, yeah. you win a bonus star on top of that one. And there's five stars for every rank, 25 through one. Okay. Um, I think there used to be more stars at the higher ranks. Um, but it just ta- it's just, you just you play a lot of fucking Hearthstone if you want to get really high ranks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I do play competitive decks that you would see at those high ranks. Um, I like p- fucking around with a lot of little stuff around. I I def- am not play to win, or I am not free to, I am not free to play. I am pay to play. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I regularly buy par- card packs and fun stuff. Well, like and or at least twice. I, and every time one of the expansion comes out, you're like, all right, let me get spend another 50 bucks for... Pre- I do the pre-order, and then I do another like $50 mm-hmm. on top of that. That's all I've done so far, yeah. I think. Maybe I've bought another 50. I, I have spent money on this game. <laughs> yeah, this is why he's, he is like, no, to magic. Because no! Because <laughs> I can't disenchant the old cards and get that one I need. Mm-mm. Every card is the same cost. Yep. Uh, that's all. Fantastic Q&A as always. May the Mile High Game guys forever be recognized at future cons. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> we were not recognized at Geekway, to my knowledge. No, besides the to, people. To my knowledge, I, aside no. from people who knew us yes. and like were in direct communication with us. They're like, oh, the My High Game guys, also known as those people we just know. Yes. <laughs> or like Matt, who was like, you know, hey, Matt, this is where we're sitting. Come over mm-hmm. and buy a t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> buy our shit. <laughs> All right. And the next one is from our Euphoria review. Right on. Uh, this is from Wesley. I just finally played this at Geekway. Now I own it. Great one. 
I'll have to give this one a listen. Give this episode a listen. That was the guy we talked to at Geekway, right? Yes, that was the guy we were talking to yeah. right there at the end of the day on Sunday, uh, shortly before we left to go get our parting barbecue meal as mm-hmm. we left St. Louis. Um, he had seen me on a few of the heavy cardboard streams, and when I was frantically looking for Indonesia slash 18xx players, uh, he had gotten in touch with me, and we didn't end up getting to play anything together, but he did come over to say hi. And uh, and then said he was going to listen to the show on his like twelve hour drive home. Um, and from our download statistics, that probably happened. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. So, uh, but that's it. Indeed, it is. Right on. Well, that wraps everything up for this episode. Uh, thanks everybody who chimed in uh, on past BGG threads or sent in emails. We really appreciate that. Gives us something else to uh, chit chat about. If you would like to get a hold of us, you can send us emails. Emails at milehighgameguys.com. You can go join the Board Game Geek Guild, Guild number 2731, where we post up a weekly episode discussion threads. Uh, You can comment on those before the episode, and we'll talk about them when we record. Or if you post them up after the fact, we'll address them on the next banter episode. You know, how we do things. Um, You can also find all of us over on Twitter. I tweet under at MHGameGuys. I am Zach underscore MHGG. I am Jeff underscore MHGG. We are also on Facebook and Instagram slash Mile High Game Guys. And we also highly recommend you go over to our website, milehighgameguys.com, where there's in the show notes of our episode releases, there is a link to join our Slack channel, uh, which is constantly getting bigger and bigger and more and more chatty. Uh, as Jeff could attest every time he looks at it, he's like, you have hundreds of unread messages. <laughs> like, I have to work during the day. What are you people doing? They're working at a desk where they can just be like, I'm just going to chat on here for 20 minutes. Yeah. yeah. Just have it open in another tab and casually switch over and Oh, I miss, I miss those days. I have to move thousands of pounds of beer around with a forklift. How am I supposed to do Slack at the same time? Poorly. Or, poorly drive a forklift yeah. and then be on Slack. Yeah. Okay. Got it. That is exactly. I mean, that's how I do it. <laughs> it is. Hence why things have been broken. <laughs> I've broken some things. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of the Slack channel. One of the perks for supporting us over on Patreon, patreon.com slash milehighgameguys, is access to the private Slack channel over there on our overall Slack. It gets raunchy. It 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 does uh, <laughs> maybe happen. I don't know. Secret things. Uh, but I bring up Patreon not because I want you to do a pledge. Well, I do. But more importantly, we have another new Patreon or another new patron over there on patreon.com. Uh, Eddie just pledged a whole dollar. <sighs> just gearing up. So the downside is Eddie, I don't think has ever contacted us before. So we know nothing. We about know this nothing person. about Eddie. Uh, all I know is Eddie clearly likes us enough to give us money, but not does not like us enough to interact with us in any other way. So I can only assume he's some sort of hoarder. Shut in person, not social. <laughs> uh, he only gets any of his board game activities through our voices. Uh, the only ones that come through on his uh, crazy uh, UHF TV that he probably still owns. That is streaming podcast. Yes. <laughs> 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 um. <laughs> so yes, Eddie. Eddie clearly is a a sucky hoarder, uh, and I'm going to say that's what he is. Crazy, crazy long beard, uh, tiny, like maybe 4'10". Uh, a small, a small, tall person. A small, tall person? <laughs> tiny, tiny, tiny height. Uh, <laughs> short, short, I think is the word for that. Tiny, tiny, tall, short, no, short. That's what it is. Yes. A short, tiny hoarder that does not know how to interact with humanity, except through giving them money. Which, I mean, if there are worse ways. There are worse ways to interact with humanity, <laughs> and there's certainly worse ways to interact with us. So I'll take it. And have. Thank you, Eddie, for, uh, for your support. We really do appreciate it. Yes. Um, yes. Thank you. You know, as much as Jeff loves ripping on the $1 pledges. And, and you know, it's a, it's a new experience. I just get to come up with whatever the fuck I want. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> Especially when it's in a vacuum, Indeed. like it is with Eddie, where we know nothing about him. Yes. Uh, Besides he's probably t- he's probably in that vast folder of disaster emails that we've never read. Not going to say no to that, but he's given us a dollar. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Eddie. We really do appreciate it. Uh, and thank you to everyone else who supports us over there on Patreon. Um, yeah, 
But yeah, thanks everybody for listening. Hopefully y'all enjoyed the show. And finally, don't forget to go over and check out our sponsors, Gray Fox Games, at their website, grayfoxgames.com, where you can check out all of the awesome games they have, including Harvest Dice, their roll and write game that I got to play at Geekway. It has a fantastic little piggy meeple first player marker and bunches and bunches of cute little dice. And you're planting vegetables or feeding a pig. And it's fantastic. Nice little simple roll and write for two to four players. So go check out that and all of the other great games over there at grayfoxgames.com. Jeff, I trust you have a prepared statement to go along with this. As always, Gray Fox Games, quality games, cleverly crafted. Also, don't regret your past. Learn from it. Regrets only make a person weaker. Solid advice. From Solid Snake. (laughs) (laughs) Right on. Well, that uh, brings the show to its natural conclusion and end point. As always, I have been your host, Adrian. I am still Zach. And I am not sick yet, Jeff. (laughs) (laughs) Bye. 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 So when Jeff said, only one email earlier. There was, there's two. It was no, a no. damn long. <clears throat> Th- that was, that was the one email. This is the prequel, but like <laughs> an offshoot that has nothing to do with the actual email. Yeah, spiritual pre- prequel. Yes, yes. Punchboard <laughs> Media, where we all bring something to the table. Pull up a chair at punchboardmedia.com. Punch